Thank you for joining us. We have the special honor to have with us today a man who for over 40 years is often perceived as the voice of Israel. As a television anchor and documentary filmmaker for so many decades, he was known as Mr. Television. Our guest, Mr. Chaim Yavin, is the foremost personality on television, honored and regarded as Israel's Walter Cronkite. He was also awarded the Israel Prize and will share his thoughts on Israel, past and present, following these messages. Tell me everything that's happening. The horse is old Jenkinson. Um, that's Bacon Bacon. He never puts sunscreen on. Never? Because it's Bacon. That is a girl that is friends with the flamingo. And what's this? That's you, Mommy. When a child can create on a canvas as big as their imagination, that's the way it should be. The HP TouchSmart 520T. Only from HP, the world's number one PC maker. ערב טוב, שלום רב לכם. לכולכם מירושלים, ערב טוב ושלום רב. With us now is Israel's legendary broadcaster, Mr. Chaim Yavin. Mr. Yavin, Chaim, if I may call you that, yes. it's a real honor and privilege to have Pleasure. you on our show today. Pleasure to be on your show. Thank you, sir. You've witnessed so many exciting things in the career uh, that you've had in Israel from the first days of television, which was, I think, in 1967. No, it was not 67, small correction, 68. One year after the Six Day War. Uh, this was the beginning of Israeli television. It's interesting to go back in time and relive those moments. Back in 1967, I started working for Israel's educational TV, and a little later, general TV broadcasts began in Israel, and it seemed that society in Israel changed as a result. People started watching television more, and it seemed that they'd converse and socialize a lot less. What are your thoughts on how television influenced society in Israel? If you speak about television today, we're just like any other country on the earth. We have got about a hundred television stations that you can uh, uh, have in your home. But at those days, you know, depends who you're talking to. On a political side, people were watching television, but not Israeli television. There were television stations all around. People were watching Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon. And the government came to the conclusion that having had this enormous victory on the Six Day War, we ought to show the Arabs, first of all, that we don't have horns, that we are human beings, and that we are a humanistic state, and that we wish well. We want peace with the Arabs, and we want to show how humane and how nice we are. This is why we should have, as soon as possible, a television station of our own to show how nice we are. And it was decided in the summer of 67, right after the war, that within half a year, we ought to have a television station of our own, which became a reality, but it was too fast and we live with the mistakes that we did at that time, up until this very day. But this is another story. This is really very interesting, and people continuously accuse Israel of making mistakes. Please elaborate and tell us what kind of mistakes you believe were made in broadcasting. You see, television is first of all, first and foremost, an industry. You've got to run things like you should run a big, big, big and to, uh, undertaking. And we didn't realize this in the first place. We thought, oh, we are intelligent people and we'll get the best uh, experts from the Jewish world all around. And they'll come and we'll build up the best of television that the world has seen. But we did not lay the infrastructure for a real good uh, modern 
uh, network. To go into details would take us a whole discussion, but the administrative side, money-wise, the uh, organization of people, the experts, everything was very much improvised. And this cost us very dearly in way of mistakes, of blunders, and of all sorts of uh, impossibilities that you could see in an organization that was just, you know, on its first, uh, in its first steps. So uh, this is, uh, you know, we crumbled it. in a way. You can say that uh, Israeli television, Israeli television, was established to some extent like the Jewish state. You know, first you build a road, then you ask, hey, where's this road leading to? So a lot of improvisation, a lot of we can do it. A lot of, we can jump higher, but where do we jump? A Jewish sort of uh, way of, of organizing things, which is not always very well organized, but a lot of goodwill, a lot of Zionism, if you want, a lot of belief in the medium. We thought that we could do a better television station who is BBC, who is CBS, we could do better, but we didn't. So we live with it to this very day. We had a few very, very good achievements along the years, some amazing things that we did, um, but we did a lot of blunders. We did a lot of mistakes and we paid dearly for them. While sitting with you here right now, I'm remembering how along with everyone else, I watched you on national television for so many years, so effectively and eloquently presenting the news and reassuring the public with your presence in good and bad times. We all saw you as nothing less than the voice of Israel. So I'd like to ask you, why in your opinion is Israel shown today throughout the world in a generally negative light, the media that is? Well, Israel's image is a part of Israeli policy. And about it is about uh, the political situation in the Middle East. There are a few facts. The Arabs don't like us. The Arabs would like us to disappear from the area. We are a foreign, we're a strange lot that has decided to go back to its ancient country but why should we, the Palestinians and the Arabs, why should we suffer? Why should we pay for it? So this is the objective situation. I think there's a factor of some anti-Semitism. It's not very strong. It's not the first and foremost reason why people around the world don't like us too much. Now, if you're obstinate and if you insist on having your policy of being strong, of beating all your enemies through all the wars, then people hate you even more. And Israel has insisted on having an activist, I say activist and not only active. Activist is, an, is, a, is, is a, a verb that was really invented by the leaders of the Yishuv, of the Commonwealth of Israel, which says we are not waiting at home for the others to attack us, but we are attacking the others. We're leading the war into their territory. Not aggressively, but in order to win a war, you don't wait for your enemy to come and do harm to you in your home. So I think that owing to this factor, we have flourished and we've won all the wars. Some wars we have won in the field, but lost in the diplomatic arena. 
this is why Israel suffers from a negative uh, point of view of its reputation. You're obstinate, you don't want peace, you're killing the Arabs, you are the Goliath, the Arabs have turned into David. Where are all the nice things that you so-called stand for? You're not that. You don't want peace. You'll hear a lot of people around the world uh, saying Israel doesn't want peace. And it's not only a question of propaganda. It's a question also of the policy of Israel. Does Israel do all it can to win that peace? You're speaking to someone who wants peace, and I'm just one of the seven million Israelis who want peace. The Arabs want peace. Everybody wants peace. But if you insist on some of your principles, so to say, settlements, in other words, you won't budge. You won't move one inch. You won't relocate one little settlement then you pay the price. Then people call you rightly so, obstinate, and you're going, they're accusing you of getting away from the line, from your promises of, for example, two states for two nations. And I think nothing will happen in the region unless we activate, we bring about the uh, our own declaration that we want a state for the Palestinians. If we don't give them a state of their own, their uprising against the Jewish state will go on and on and on like a sickness that goes on, that goes with us. And you can, you know, getting back to your question, you can be very nice in a show, you can do, you can speak nice words, you can win even something at the United uh, Nations. You can win the goodwill of the West, especially of the United States, but then people come and ask themselves, okay, how long? How long can we win the goodwill of the United States? of the Jewish people at all. And we will have to find a solution uh, to that problem, or else we won't be able to exist. We need peace more than they do. And no explanation around the world, and no declarations, and no good people, and we have a lot of good diplomats. They can't do anything in the way of Hasbara, of, of, uh, of, how do you say, of propaganda. We will have to do something. And it takes a lot of bravery. It takes a lot of strength, of heart, to do this thing um, in order to bring it about because you have to convince the majority of the people of Israel that we've got to give in, we've got to give up, a lot of our assets, which is a very, very tough undertaking. But en brera, we say, no choice. We'll have to do it. Chaim, this is very interesting and a very compelling subject. I'd like us to continue, but we must pause for these messages. We'll be right back. We are back with Chaim Yavin. Chaim, thinking again about what you just said, there are many people who agree with you and those who do not. It reminds me of an interview I conducted with Abba Evin, one of Israel's most highly respected statesmen. I asked him years ago, why would the Arabs accept today what they refused to accept before 1967, when they had East Jerusalem, the West Bank, Gaza, and the Golan? What's changed? The answer is twofold. Because on the one hand, we've won our war. This, this war has been going on for 60, 100 years. And we've had the upper hand. If you judge what happened in the battlefield 
We won all the wars. A terrible price. We lost about 2,200 people in the Yom Kippur War, and so on and so forth. I've never seen myself, I'm an old man now, I've never seen one day of peace in all my life. There was always a war going on. War of attrition, Lebanon War, the Yom Kippur War, the Six Day War. So, and we've won them in the battlefield. We've been stronger. Our activist way of handling the situation, the conflict between us and the Arabs was justified, now in a, in a way was justified along the lines that Ben-Gurion really paved for us. Because it's a question what you do when they come and kill one of you. Do you then run to the United Nations or do you fight back? How do you fight back? You stand behind walls and shoot back or you attack? And the Yishuv, the Jewish society, most of it, said, no, we counterattack. And in this respect, we have set the world before a fact that we are we cannot be relinquished, we cannot be conquered, we cannot be won against. But we have not won the big war. And the big war is to be accepted by the Arab world. Now, the, your question is, why should the Arab world accept today what they didn't accept then? They have also come to the conclusion that by force, they cannot destroy Israel. They have probably come to the deep understanding that by force alone, they cannot do a serious harm to Israel. On the contrary, Israel gets stronger. I think we have a fantastic economy today. All problems given and, you know, and we have the, one of the strongest armies in the world one of the strongest the Air Force, but we have not peace. And without peace, we cannot live, really. We cannot be normal. We don't have boundaries. We don't have a peaceful economy. We thrive because we survive. And this is a paradox with which we live, and I think the Arabs understand that. You know, they, 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 they stand aside and say, damn it, why can't we win against this midget? Uh, but the midget gets stronger and stronger every year. Question is, what are we going to do at the end? What's going to happen at the end of the road? What is going to happen with us and the Palestinians? And we have a double prob problem here. You have the Palestinians outside Israel, we have the Palestinians, actually, you have a triple problem here. The Palestinians outside Israel and outside the territories, the Palestinians within the territories, Gaza and Samaria and Judea, and the Palestinians within Israel, the Arab population in Israel, which is almost 20% of the population here. So it's a problem over a problem over a problem. Can we live together? like two neighbors. And you must remember one thing, nobody's going nowhere. We're not going to disappear. The Arabs are not going to disappear. We're going to, be, we're going to stay here. So if you stay here forever and forever, you've got to learn how to live together. They are beginning to understand this, and we are beginning to understand this. We still have a long way to go. I'm thinking again about all the 40 continuous years that you were seen as the foremost personality on Israel TV. Please share with our audience some of the highlights of your career. What comes to mind? We're going to need more than one interview for that. <laughs> <laughs> a whole book, maybe. There, there were happy 
great moments and sad. Let's start with the bad. Um, oh no, let's start with the with the. Uh, I think first of all, my first day on television. It was uh, when I appeared the first uh, time. I didn't go to television. I, st I started on radio first where I did documentaries. And my intention was in coming to television to do documentaries on television. And then I did several jobs and they were doing uh, some auditions. And they said, hey, you come. They didn't even think about me. I was strolling in the corridor and people were doing uh, auditions. And the head of news told me, hey, get into the studio. Let's see how you are, Mr. Yavin. And I went in and they were all stunned because all of a sudden one of them said, hey, we've got our presenter, we've got our anchorman. And this was the first uh, thing that I did on television. And this was really, uh, for me, a great su surprise. I didn't expect me to become Mr. Television and Mr. whatever they called me later on. And I, it stayed with me 40, 50 years. Uh, I then became all sort of editor, correspondent. I even served in the United States three years as a correspondent there. So my, uh, my career was very rich and very, uh, with many colors. And I probably did, did all sorts of professions, television professions that you could imagine anchorman and editor and correspondent and writer, whatever. And uh, of course, if you, if you are, I also was the, the director general of Israeli television. In a small organization, this is also possible. <clears throat> and if you, if you do so many jobs over so many years, then of course you go through the history of Israel. So you can really, and we were one station Imagine in the, in the country, uh, we had ma monopoly. You were watching only one, one, one mabat, one look. That was the name of the show. So you can really read the history of the state through the news magazine that we did. As simple as that. And in this respect, I can remember very vividly, extremely vividly, uh, some of the great historic events. For example, they told us, hey, tomorrow Sadat is coming to Israel. This was after the Yom Kippur War. And my, co my political correspondent phoned me and he said, listen, Sadat is coming tomorrow to Israel. And I said, yes, you and me are going to the moon. It was so, <laughs> such a fant fantastic th story. And then we had to produce this thing, which was for a small station. They came from CBS and said, hey, listen, it's not for you. You can't do it. And we said, we will do it. And we did it successfully. עשר בנובמבר 1977, שמונה בערב. נשימת העולם נעצרת למראה התגשמותו של הלא ייאמן.
a sad story was, of course, the murder of, uh, of Rabin. Uh, I couldn't utter the words, Rabin is dead. So I, I found all sorts of ways and means and wordings to express this grief that suddenly struck the state. And really the, the state was, I think, is changed from that time. An absolutely horrific crime and great tragedy. I'd like to thank you so very much for sharing your thoughts with us today. It's been a real privilege and an honor. And as I mentioned, no one in the world is more qualified than you, Jaime Avin, to express these views. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Richard.